Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Al Murray. In the news this week, in London, as work is completed on the Olympic high diving arena, the organising committee denies that budget cuts have affected the quality of the pool. A senior professor of physics at Cambridge reveals his complex mathematical formula which explains why men find puerile humour so amusing. <laughs> <laughs> and after announcing that the UK's national debt is considerably lower than first thought, Gordon Brown realises Alistair Darling's put the decimal point in the wrong place again. In his ops team tonight is a comedian who describes himself on his website as pessimistic but experimenting with optimism. I wouldn't bother, mate, it's overrated. Please welcome Mark Watson. <laughs> and with Paul Merton is a feminist who drove to the studio tonight, but don't worry, I did the parking for her. Please welcome. <laughs> Be helpful. <laughs> Please welcome Jermaine Greer. <laughs> In round one, we cover the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Mark, take a look at this, please. It's like an old computer game. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's heartbeat going down. Mm. This is pretty cheerful stuff so far. Oh, that. Oh, hello. Darling. Alistair reading the pre budget report. Who wrote you? this rubbish? <laughs> That's sad. Uh, they're having to close Woolworths because hundreds of people have been killed by falling signs. <laughs> That's Damien Hurst. That was the pre budget report. Yeah, you'd think he would sort of know what was in it already. You wouldn't think he'd have to read it, really, darling. Given <laughs> <laughs> well, that Gordon wrote it, I think he did oh, have to. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of it was quite a surprise to him. <laughs> it's a whole package of measures to yeah. save us all. Yeah. We've got into terrible trouble for years by excess borrowing, so we're going to borrow! <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the whole report. Isn't it? We're going to be a trillion pounds in debt after this? Yeah. That is an awful lot. I mean, well, if you bring up your bank balance and it says that, you'll feel pretty crushed, I okay. think. <laughs> That's quite bad, isn't it? I don't it? know how I'm going to make that back, Ian. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're young enough that you will have to make it back. We'll all yeah. be dead. <laughs> 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 I thought no one else looked as worried as I was about it. Yeah. <laughs> what was Damien Hurst doing in the middle of that? Well, apparently he's laid off a few people. There have been some very big redundancies, 50,000 in Citigroup and a couple in Damien's workhouse. Yeah. <laughs> um, workhouse? Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Things have improved about how he makes those sculptures. <laughs> very small boys sculpting away. Yes, basically, this is Alistair Darling, Darling's pre budget report. Alistair Darling. Alistair, Al Alistair Darling. <laughs> Yeah, that's a much better name. That's yeah. a better name. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, if we start yeah. calling him that now, then everybody will eventually be forced to call him Alistair yeah. Darjeeling. Let's do it then. Yeah, yeah. 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 start now. The revolution yeah. starts here. Yeah. Yeah. Alistair, this is Alistair Darjeeling's <laughs> pre budget report. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you all sort of feel a bit more it, sort of kindly towards him if he reminds and you of And his basic nice remedy would yeah. be a nice cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this will work. Yeah. So the vat is going down, though, isn't that right? What well, do it's going down for a bit, and then it's going to go up again. Marks and Spencers have said they're going to pass on the cut in full. How much, panel, yep. how much yep. will the price of an M&S jumper currently costing 10 quid drop? Can you do the sums for me? Yeah, £5.80. Oh. <laughs> will it be free? It's, just no, it's not going to be free. No. <laughs> it's 2.5%. It's rather difficult because we're having to assume that the VAT is already on the jumper. And what if we don't like the jumper? So it's going to be... <laughs> Oh, no, you've got to buy the jumper. No, right? What is yeah, this? It's a bloody jumper. What is this, Albania? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is this? Because so we've got a choice. Two and a half percent of ten quid, which is twenty-five p. It's not that. It's really cut right because the ten pounds is one hundred and seventeen point five in percent. Yeah. So they're shaving off two percent. So it's not actually two point five percent. It wor it's twenty-one p. Oh. I can't explain it. What <laughs> <laughs> Watch Newsnight, for Christ's sake. <laughs> now, the, uh, I'm still not convinced this VAT stuff is the comic goal we all thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's also um, plans to introduce a higher top rate yeah. of tax. <laughs> oh, we should do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a big sympathy get outside yeah. the studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, people who earn more than a million quid a minute might have to pay more tax. No, it's, it's 100,000 a year, I gather. Is it? Yeah. I've looked very closely, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Most of the time, I think people in that situation are very happy to pay tax. But I have friends who feel... <laughs> <laughs> ..that paying more tax in order to compensate for the fact that a lot of bankers have messed it up completely for the last ten years is quite annoying. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Mark? Is that going to...? Well, it makes... Yeah, the audience member laughs sceptically, he'll never get a hundred grand. I'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> still allowed to have an opinion. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. allowed to have an opinion. I'm not going to fritter all the way on Marks and Spencer's jumpers, that's for no. sure. Uh, <laughs> Half the Sun uh, started depicting Alistair Darling recently. Have you seen No, they've started calling him Alistair Darjeeling. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, how have the Sun started depicting Alistair Darling recently? Is it one, one of the Thunderbirds? Yeah. We can have a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jermaine, are you a fan of Alistair Darling? I mean, did you once ask him if he loved you? I mean, you, you must remember back in 1968, you made a small film about Alistair Darling, I believe. Oh, we can have a look at that. I think. What? what? Darling! Oh, <laughs> you love me! Love, 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 love! <laughs> 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 Did you have access to drugs in the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> the kit on, though, didn't I? You couldn't do that now. You'd have to get the kit off or you'd just there'd be no point, would there? <laughs> <laughs> or having a woman and a camera yeah. to be no point. <laughs> yeah, so Taking clothes off, love, we're wasting our time. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone know how much this economic bailout compares to other cost of other major world events? Like, say, the First World War. Oh, well, that was pricey. Yeah. <laughs> But it was in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> so. and they an actual blood. cost for the First World yeah. War. Yeah, someone yeah. priced it up. The Treasury say they reckon this is good, this is going the bailout's going to cost twice as much as the First World War's cost. But it will be better than the First World War. Yeah, well, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> you sort of get what you pay for. <laughs> and also, it won't be over by Christmas, will it? <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be like in the war where there's sort of wheelbarrows with notes in. I haven't even got a wheelbarrow, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> Which war was this? <laughs> well, the problem is that there was a war and people did put money in wheelbarrows. Well, yeah. that, that's an A star. <laughs> that's right. <yeah. laughs> this is Alistair Darling's pre budget report and the leaked news that they were going to increase VAT. In an attempt to balance the books, the government is reportedly drawing up plans to privatise the Met Office. Although the Met Office are confidently forecasting it won't happen. <laughs> How are we going to know what the weather is? You always go outside. <laughs> and look ahead. <laughs> Financially, the future looks brighter for families than it does for single parents. At least that was the argument Gordon Ramsay tried with his missus. Frankly, a, s <laughs> Frankly, a simple sorry would have probably stood a better chance. <laughs> Paul and Jermaine, what's going on here? Beautiful South American boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a Barry Manilow song. That's a sad person. Is this Barry Manilow's core audience? <laughs> <laughs> very I think that's Jonathan Ross's love child. That right, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to remember a story that I saw out of the corner of my eye. A guy who mm -hmm. is awaiting trial in Brazil. Yeah, Brazil, it, yeah. Is Copacabana... Yeah, that's in Brazil, in Brazil? Rio, yeah. Uh, because they, he, he was caught carrying This is more like a spiritualist act, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he was... He Doesn't was... name Elvis Presley <laughs> mean anything to you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is that. I think it could be a story about uh, people in America who have been imprisoned and uh, their punishment is to be played Barry Manilow music <laughs> and they sit there and they say, OK, just don't play side B, I'll never do it again. You are absolutely right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the town of Fort Lupton, Colorado. If you violated noise regulations, you have to be made to listen to Barry Manilow for one hour at full volume four times a year. <laughs> four times a year? Yeah. Yeah. Not even his fans listen to it that much. Yeah. <laughs> Would it work? <laughs> Would it work? No, no, it wouldn't work. No, you just sit there for an hour and think, oh, I've got to listen to Barry Manilow, then they go and smash a car radio up. <laughs> According to Sky News, if anyone is found to actually like one of these tunes, it's removed from the place. <laughs> <laughs> what else do offenders have to listen to, apart from Barry? Any ideas? I sort of missed this story myself. 
Let me have to listen to a, uh, a, a pirate record and a Barbra Streisand complaining to a plumber about the lack of service over the weekend. <laughs> and her boiler's gone. And Bill Clinton was coming up the drive. He got washed away all down, down the drain. He went down in the sewers and he had to be rescued by a helicopter pilot dangling a rope over the great big drain as it went over the overfall and then picked up the Clinton, brought him back, put him down on the guard and he said, there we are. That didn't take long, did it? <laughs> It breaks my heart to say no, no. <laughs> no why are you smiling then? Well, because <laughs> it breaks your heart. No, it's Barney the Dinosaur. They have to listen to that. Just oh, yes. Half as good. We've got a little clip of that now. <laughs> He's definitely going to crack that one. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on the subject of criminal offences, what's Harriet Harman up to here? She's soliciting. <laughs> New Thai girls, choice of t two available, satisfaction always, Junction 11 M4 parking available. <laughs> it seems I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even seen it. No, it's Harriet Harman crusading against the advertising of prostitution. The poor old prostitutes collective have been flat out all week trying to talk <laughs> sense to people. That is their job, yeah. to me. <laughs> you are always unimaginative, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> their argument is, deal with the traffickers, don't steamroller everybody. The average uh, client, they're hardly going to say, um, are you um, freely available for um, uh, uh, no strings attached, untrafficked sex, and the traffickers around the corner with a gun? I mean, they're not, they're not going to say, oh no. I mean, you're, you're taking the word of the English collective of prostitutes rather literally, I think. Well, I why assume we? that they know their own industry. Why they would they be know telling more about the truth? Well, why wouldn't they? I never thought I'd be between well, Jermaine Greer and Ian Hislop, and they'd be debating whether or not you can take a prostitute's word. My <laughs> <laughs> reason. This is pretty much as good as my life's going to get, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do hope not. <laughs> you know, we, we need the expert here. We need Angus. <laughs> <laughs> I think honestly, that's yeah. the first time in six years somebody said that. <laughs> Harriet Harman has called on the members of the Women's Institute to help bring an end to prostitution. Sue Atkinson of the Cambridge Women's Institute said, it's women doing something for other women. Yeah, I saw that ad too. It's disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to feel sorry for women who have to exploit their naked bodies to raise money, said one prostitute flicking through the WI calendar. <laughs> Harriet Harman's campaign to stop sex ads in newspapers comes at a bad time for prostitutes who've got enough problems as it is working out what the reduction in VAT will do to their prices. <laughs> Fail at the end of that round. Two points each. And now to round two and some of the even smaller stories of the week. Buzz, when you know what this noise is. Paul. Is it a bluebird trying to regurgitate a trumpet? <laughs> go on. Do you mean go on? <laughs> it's making a picture of that happening. OK. The bluebird goes to Ronnie Scott's, likes a bit of jazz, starts sort of tapping away, says to the jazz drummer, he says, listen, you know, do you think you can introduce me to the band lately? He says, yeah, why not? We're having a drink at the bar later on. So he goes up to the bar, he goes up to the jazz trumpet, and he says, you know, mate, you know, if I was you, I'd play that much better than you. The jazz trumpet he says, oh, yeah, well, look, and shoved the throat down, and then he regurgitated later in the forest when he was being tape recorded by Bill Oddie on a secret sojourn in the woods. <laughs> No. <laughs> it wasn't Bilotti. It wasn't Bilotti, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. The sound you heard there is the chilling proof that a sofa in Bristol is haunted. <laughs> I thought that was... <laughs> Fact. That's the sofa talking, is it? No, no, it's the owners of the sofa. They're called Christine and Nigel Strange. <laughs> Here's a picture of Mr and Mrs Strange. Here we go. <laughs> is that the sofa that's haunted? That's the haunted sofa. They're very brave to sit on it at all, really. <laughs> obviously, they spoke to the Sun reporter, Mr Desperate, about this. 
<laughs> it does look like the young Bruce Forsyth, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was it, yeah. Strictly what? come sofa. <laughs> Mrs. Strange first discovered that sofa was inhabited by a ghost. She told the son, one Sunday morning, I sat down on it with a cup of tea and suddenly heard this odd squeaky noise. Poppy, my Yorkshire Terrier, heard it too. <laughs> Which is the bigger story there, the haunted sofa or the talking dog? That's the question. <laughs> this isn't the first time a piece of furniture has been haunted. You can, in fact, buy a book called Possessed Possessions, Haunted Antiques, Furniture and Collectibles. <laughs> Any idea what piece of furniture Billy Peaches was terrorised by, according to this book? Any idea? Easy chair, occasional table, occasionally it was a table, occasionally it was a monster! <laughs> <laughs> this is kitchen cabinet doors. <laughs> yeah, now, this book has actually been described by one reviewer as 99 interminably tedious pages. <laughs> Talking of the afterlife, what has David Tennant controversially been holding this week? A skull. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's holding the skull of a guy who died in the early 80s who, who willed his skull to be used at some point in a production of Hamlet, and that's what they've really? been doing. Yeah, as you're yeah. Yeah. He yeah. was a concert pianist and he loved Shakespeare, and his yeah. dying wish was to have his He's skull. He's called used. Andre Tchaikovsky. Gosh, yeah. Yes. I don't know if he was a relation or not. No, nor do I. I didn't think you would. That's, no. that's usually <laughs> what the chair does, is, is, is know that stuff. The um, chair. <laughs> the chair. Yeah. The yeah. chair. <laughs> Temptation to do a ventriloquist act in the middle of that would be too much for me. That's why you've never been hounded. And last poor Yoick, and you'd have to turn and look at the audience and come back. <laughs> and then you could do the emu with it. <laughs> Go and attack Polonius. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> and this is a sofa in Bristol believed by its owners to be haunted. <laughs> it still is not a story, is it? <laughs> Exactly what Even it is. in a thin week, this is really pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> man in Newcastle believes the condensation on his bedroom window is Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> also in the news this week, the yeah. skull of pianist Andre Tchaikovsky, who left it to the Royal Shakespeare Company in his will, and it's now appearing as Yorick opposite David Tennant in Hamlet. The skull is not the only part of Mr Tchaikovsky's remains to be put to good use by the Royal Shakespeare Company. His kneecaps are used in Henry V to suggest the arrival of a messenger's horse. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Yeah. Why was this little drawing in the news this week? It's only got seven legs. Ah, is this a spider that can only turn left? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, this is the spider drawing that was offered as settlement of an overdue utility bill. <laughs> <laughs> Australian man David Thorne wrote to an accounts department. <laughs> Dear Jane, I do not have any money, so I'm sending you this drawing I did of a spider instead. <laughs> I value the drawing. $233 for time, so I trust that this settles the matter. Regards, <laughs> David. What did they say to that? Well, it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to Mr Thorne's surprise, accounts clerk Jane Gillis felt that the company would prefer the bill to be paid using money. <laughs> Here's a drawing of you opening the door to the bailiffs. <laughs> Well, he's got eight legs on it, really. Well, yeah, really, he cheated them on a, on a leg. Well, this is the thing, you see. Um, the, matter, the, the whole matter of the legs came up. Mm. Um, uh, she returned his email and he questioned its authenticity, saying, are you sure this drawing of a spider is the one I sent you? <laughs> this spider only has seven <laughs> legs. <laughs> and I do not feel I would have made such an elementary mistake when I drew it. In a year's time, it'll all be our currency. <laughs> <laughs> spiders, spiders have been in the news as well. How did one get lost in space recently? <laughs> Was it an overambitious spider trying to spin a web between Earth and the moon? <laughs> Cat space flies. <laughs> I wish it was. Yeah, it wasn't, no. An overambitious no. spider, no. No, NASA um, sent two spiders to the International Space Station on board the shuttle. They're very we short of money now. Yeah. It used that. to be three or four men, yeah. but now yeah. it's two spiders. Yeah. <laughs> Stick with a matchbox and a strong bloke throws it up here. <laughs> and the speeches aren't so good. It's eight small steps for a spider. <laughs> Yes, it was sent up to space, according to the Times, to help answer school children's questions about how spiders spin webs in space. <laughs> and now it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I hope those children feel great. <laughs> David Thorne has been described as a self-confessed serial prankster from Australia. 
what's not to like? <laughs> the original spider drawing had seven legs. It's been nicknamed Heather Mills. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not because it's got a missing leg, but because it once trapped a beetle. <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Why is this woman sitting in a frozen fish van? I think she might be doing an experiment. Did children ask... How, how long did it take water to boil at the Antarctic? North Pole? It's, it's Antarctical. Antarctical. It is Antarctical. You're, you're, you're heading in the right direction. This really was quite a tiny story, wasn't it? <laughs> Not compared to some of the ones we've had. <laughs> <laughs> Has this woman been sent something from the South Pole? A fish finger. <laughs> fish don't have fingers. Oh, damn. I've been eating them for years. <laughs> well, that's why they haven't got fingers anymore. You've eaten a lot. <laughs> Rachel Andrews, who's been training for an expedition to the South Pole yeah. by sitting in a frozen fish van in Plymouth. Yeah. Does she have to go out every few minutes and say, I may be some time? <laughs> <laughs> she's in training for a South Pole trip. Uh, apparently, she's practising taking off gloves and generally getting used to the cold. <laughs> I'm amazed you don't know about this story. Yeah. Or care. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's story has started quite a debate on the message board. Well, I'll bet it has. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> what is... <laughs> what is it's Ralph... a cracking story, isn't it? <laughs> what have you Ralph got a from life? London? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> what did Ralph from London have to say about all this? Nobody cares. Well... <laughs> <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph went on the front foot and said, yeah. Stop being so silly, love. Get back home and fix her old man's tea. <laughs> <laughs> In other vehicle-related news, what's this man up to? Oh, God, is he going round the equator? <laughs> He's sitting on a bus to see what it feels like to be a bit warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, su yeah. you're surprisingly close. Yeah. <laughs> This is a man called Graham Smith on Harold, his double-decker bus. Why, what's so special about Harold? It started off as a cufflink. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sort of he built the bus around it. He sort of thought, oh, I was going to get on his shirt, and then started building the bus around it. So after about ten years, what was a cufflink is now a bus. And he's ruined his shirts. <laughs> You're surprisingly close. <laughs> no. God, the, the financial news has really knocked every other story out of the way. <laughs> Did he build the bus himself? Did he make it himself? Well, no, he's converted the bus. <laughs> was it a Protestant? No, it was a bus. <laughs> <laughs> he's, turned it into, he's turned it into an all-mod-cons base for holidays. <laughs> Let's take Everyone a look. book up. Let's have a look. There's the, that's the comfy lounge. Yes, yeah, that's nice. I like nice. it. Yeah. It's good. And there's a pole there for dancing and everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's lovely. Well, the lower deck is home to a white Fiat which has been hidden away there ever since that little scrape they had in the tunnel when they were on holiday in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> which means, at the end of this round... <laughs> in this round, it's Ian and Mark with two points and Paul and Jermaine with two points. <laughs> well, that was worth doing. <laughs> so, yeah. Do we take it from that that the entire round was in many ways pointless? Yeah. <laughs> if that's the way you want to see it. <laughs> but it is a low scoring game so far. Yes, it is. Two all after two rounds. I'm not a mathematician, but that doesn't average out very well. No, it doesn't. It's two, the average. <laughs> One, surely. <laughs> see, we seem to have hit a lull. <laughs> the production being taken over by pirates. What's happening? <laughs> Time for the odd one out round. Your four are David Blaine, Ozzy the Goldfish, Carly Zucker, and the Mark Rothko paintings Maroon on Black. Well, the goldfish, it's a goldfish that swims upside down. He's got something wrong with his swim bladder or something, so he, he, sw he thinks that everybody else is upside down, but he's the one that's upside down. <laughs> uh, obviously, David Blaine's hanging upside down, so there's an upside down link already between those two. And Carly Zucker is in the forest. And I'm a celebrity, so did they hang her upside down? <laughs> this Rothko, yeah. the painting, is hung sideways. Ah, oh, so it could be that three of them have been hung upside down, but the painting's been hung the wrong way sideways. sideways. I can hit the odd one out. Absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, yes! well done. Well done. <laughs> yep. The 
that's right. Ozzy the Goldfish has spent the last four years of her life upside down and yeah. has become something of an attraction at the pub where she lives. Should we be worried about Ozzy swimming upside down like that? They have very short memories, don't they? Very short memory span. So every four seconds he's thinking, why is he upside down? <laughs> why is he upside down? <laughs> so a lot of that's going on. I know somebody who took her goldfish to the vet because it was depressed. And the, and the vet agreed with her. He was depressed. <laughs> and told her to get another fish. <laughs> to what? keep him company. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I see. I thought you meant just sack it off and get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> so, old joke, isn't it, about two goldfish swimming around and, and the guy's looking at it and says, well, you know, see, the one in the front's called Bob. He says, well, how do you know that? The one in the back's going, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> do you do any other impressions? I can do Alec Guinness. It's in the film Kind Hearts and Coronets. You know the film with Dennis yeah. Price and all that? And he plays the part of the old vicar, Alec Guinness, and at one point he says, um, the view from my west window has all the exuberance of Chaucer with none of the concomitant crudities of the period. <laughs> the thing of me, like, the thing of me is like a funny Rory Bremner. <laughs> I can do a dripping bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and a car boot, which goes like this. <laughs> I'll close it. <laughs> and David Blaine, why was he hanging upside down? Because he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he hung upside down for 60 hours in Central Park for another one of his fascinating, brilliant, amazing <laughs> stuff. And didn't he sort of like, he wasn't actually hanging up the whole time, he did come down for 10 minute rest every hour sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. He came down once and had to receive a medical check, stretch and relieve himself. In his own defence, Blaine said, there's no way to relieve yourself and not put everybody <laughs> beneath you at risk. <laughs> One angry witness said, this is like being on hunger strike for 22 hours a day, you know, taking two hours off for lunch and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the Mark Rothko's maroon on black paintings? The experts are claiming that two of them have been hung on their side mm. in a current exhibition at the Tate Modern. Looks like a Kit Kat. Yeah. <laughs> be a dull Philistine thing to say. <laughs> and I'm glad I said it. <laughs> what did art historian Tim Marlowe have to say about this? Do we know? Don't bother me now. I've just broken up with my wife and I've... <laughs> I'm halfway through a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> Please don't say things like that. That is, uh, let me hurry to say that's not true. It's more than a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm sure Rothko was wrestling with these big spatial concerns, so there is an ambiguity. Because of this, the Tate has a certain latitude. Now, imagine <laughs> him saying that with a certain slur. <laughs> you know, the whiskey. Oh, no, he hasn't. <laughs> I withdraw everything I've said about this man. I know nothing about him. I'm sure that his wife, if he is married, is, is more than happy with him. His wife works for the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> She's the producer of The Late Show. <laughs> She's gone upstairs from that position. Right. Again, this to is get away from him. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to steer you away from okay, a well, tactical let's talk, error. Let's oh, I talk about Carly Zucker then instead. Well, yeah. She's in the jungle. Have you been watching that? I watch that because um, I'm trying to do something about the abuse of invertebrates because I'm the president of Bug Life. Uh, uh, you're the president of what? <laughs> Without them, everything else collapses. They're important, and we're having massive insect extinctions, <laughs> and it isn't funny. <laughs> Throwing thousands of innocent cockroaches at, <laughs> at Z class celebrities. It's not amusing at all. It seems the world's against you on this one. <laughs> And no, those huge amounts of insects are all bred in the trade. They're worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands. And it's, it's just madness. <laughs> the whole thing is mad. I, I do agree. <laughs> is the economic argument the same as the sort of bug right one? No, I haven't quite isn't. followed that. It's but either wrong to throw these animals at Kilroy Sill. I don't, I don't. <laughs> so, that, that, that can never be wrong. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's tigers. <laughs> I, to say that it's wrong is kind of 
a bit fundamentalist. I just think it's stupid and yeah. unimaginative and repetitive uh, and possibly cruel. I think it's right. I think it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, just have a look. What's wrong with this bottom, Jermaine? You, you've had something to say about this bottom. Cheryl Cole. Yeah. It was such a ridiculous thing. Gordon Ramsay says to me... Um, you want to go is... public on this? <laughs> <laughs> we are in his kitchen... Of course you are. <laughs> just cooking a meal. And he... The rice is bubbling away. <laughs> and he says to me... Do I agree that Cheryl Cole is the feminist for today? So I, trying to cook duck a l'orange, <laughs> <laughs> which I've never cooked before. Or pronounced before. But it was me. <laughs> it was never French, duck a l'orange. He said, did I agree that Cheryl Cole was the feminist of the future? And I said I thought she was too thin. I'm interested in the idea of Gordon Ramsay being interested in feminism. Well, <laughs> One of the F words I thought he hadn't given much thought. <laughs> no, it was meant to be um, challenging banter while I was abusing the corpse of a tiny Barbary duckling. Was this on a, <laughs> an, a reality show? <laughs> if that had been an insect, you might have felt differently about it. <laughs> To eat insects, you're also allowed to eat ducklings. Oh. Are you allowed to eat Kilroy silk? <laughs> I'm sure he'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got an image in my head. I can't get rid of Finally, how might this clip relate to the odd one out? Is the gentleman turning the wheel the wrong way round on the oil thing? Should he be turning it the other way to, to uh, do what he wants to do? Y yeah. <laughs> it was the only piece of action that was there, so I guess that, that yeah. it would have to be something to do with that. Yes, it's the title sequence. Early this week, we received the following email from yes. a sharp-eyed viewer, Mr Jack Hudson of Leicestershire, who wrote, I assume, from the look on his face, that the Russian in your cartoon is attempting to turn off the gas supply to Western Europe. <laughs> if this is the case, then he's turning the wheel of the valve the wrong way. <laughs> Clockwise closes a valve, turning it anti-clockwise, which is what he's doing, opens it. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr Hudson. <laughs> for bringing this to our attention, just for a little bit of fun, I thought I'd do a bit of research into transcontinental gas pipeline valve activation and rotation polarities. Yeah. It wasn't quite as much fun as I'd hoped, either. No. <laughs> Actually, the only reason I brought that up is because uh, we can once again enjoy this piece of footage. A Russian miner is denying that there's a drink problem amongst mine workers. Let's have a look at this. <laughs> he doesn't even work there. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> they have all spent time upside down, apart from the maroon on black paintings, which are currently hanging vertically instead of horizontally, apparently. <laughs> David Blaine hung upside down for 60 hours recently. He insisted it was necessary to take a break every hour to pee and take on liquids. Though surely, if you're hanging upside down, you can do both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Carly Zucker has been hanging upside down as part of her preparations for I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. She really does have a simple idea of Australia, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> this week, Jermaine Greer said that Cheryl Cole isn't a feminist as a healthy girl is a fat-bottomed creature. What nonsense. Cheryl Cole does have a big ass. He's called Ashley. <laughs> While we're on the football, we all love football, don't we? Yeah, love football. Kick the ball, it's good! Kick it, kick it! Yeah, it's good! Kick the ball! We all love football. Let's have yeah, a look at some football. Let's have a look at some football. I do love yeah, it. It's here's some football. <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words Round, which this week features as its guest publication the comprehensive booklet of pea recipes, Yes Peas. <laughs> and we'll start with What Grows Weary of Little Dorrit? 
person watching the first one minute of Little Dorrit. <laughs> oh, you philistine. I've read the book, sir. I disapprove of the adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a big Dorrit? True. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was. No, it's not big not Dorrit. Big Dorrit. <laughs> Audience. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yes, you're right. According to the Telegraph, although Little Dorrit has been well received by the critics, its presentation in 30-minute episodes is thought to have wearied viewers. <laughs> <laughs> wearied viewers. How much effort is it to watch something on TV? <laughs> oh, this is absolutely knackering me. Yeah. <laughs> this has been on for 22 minutes now. <laughs> not another bonnet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next, peas are extremely versatile, tasting great in what, 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 and what. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pew Pew Barney McGrew, <laughs> Cup of Dibble and Grub. <laughs> it's this. Uh, stews. Stews, good. We're going to bloody well get these. It won't be fun, but it will be necessary. <laughs> Risotto. Yes, well ah, done. Ah, risotto. Yes. Ah, 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 yeah. Casseroles. No. What? Yes! Yeah, we are. Yes. Sorry, yes, yeah, casserole. Yeah. Oh, this is going to go on forever. Yes. Going... <laughs> Pizza. It's risotto. I can't bear it. <laughs> <laughs> risotto. Kedgeri <laughs> omelette, soup, salads, casseroles, curries. <laughs> Next. Did the Russians put what in the Queen's teapot? A bug. <laughs> It's a bug. The teapot was actually in the drawing room of the late Queen Mother's house at Balmoral. MI5 first got suspicious when Russian diplomats put Moscow's entire gold reserves on Lucky Lad in the 315 <laughs> at Ascot. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it would take 390 million, 96,000 and 154 average diameter peas to what? Did it choke Eamon Holmes? <laughs> <laughs> it circled the earth. Not quite the earth. John Prescott. <laughs> it's outlined the British coast. <laughs> oh. This comes from research carried out by the MOD in 1942 when a very drunk Churchill panicked about a possible Nazi invasion. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are Ian and Mark have four points, mm, miserable. but laying waste to them are Paul and Germain with nine points. Wow, <laughs> wow. But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. <laughs> it's J.K. Growling. <laughs> <laughs> and I leave you with news that after losing six stone, Sunderland's Slimmer of the Year celebrates his win. <laughs> after bandages are removed, a Shropshire housewife discovers why her facelift was so cheap. <laughs> There's a setback for the British Man Spaceflight Project when one of the astronauts becomes entangled in the launch mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Put out the flags for a bumper edition of Buzzcocks with Simon Amstel next on BBC Two. Then at 10.15, from the wonders of Woodstock to L.A. alienation. Music from the birds to the eagles with Hotel California.